sights, smells, and sounds. So I have been trying in my work as a more senior <laughs> scientist um, when engaging with younger scientists in the field to get them to fully engage their senses, their whole sensory system um, into the work that we do. And so what I first notice about being in the Arctic, in the central Arctic, right? So this is far away from land, um, typically con you know, covered in sea ice, is that one, it's so bright. So like you must, must, must wear your sunglasses at all times between the sun coming in and the reflection off of the ice and the snow. It is the brightest um, that you will probably ever experience, especially when it's sunny. The air is so clean in that area. You don't even realize how clean it is until you get back to a place where the air is not clean. Um, so taking really big, deep breaths of that clean, crisp, cold air is sort of incredible for your lungs. And the smell, well, this is very interesting. The smell changes depending on, of course, wind direction, but it changes depending on what time of year we're actually in the Central Arctic Ocean. And that's because phytoplankton and sea ice algae release compounds that have a scent. So actually, a lot of times when you're near the ocean and smelling the ocean and the salt spray, and things like that, you're actually smelling a combination of molecules and compounds that are created by phytoplankton and algae um, that get released from the top surface of the ocean by waves and bubbles um, into the atmosphere, and that's what we're picking up. And so that ocean smell is actually a smell of the contribution of phytoplankton that are growing using CO2 and, and creating oxygen. So the smell is very interesting because sometimes we can tell what types of phytoplankton may be more abundant based on the way the air smells. And so I actually have students and other colleagues with me when we take ice cores, actually smell the ice core and also smell the hole that we just made in the ice. Um, I know it sounds weird, but it's actually really interesting to do. And actually, when I was in the Antarctic this last winter, I, I did that with folks. They thought I was crazy, but then they, they they, they, they were like catching on that indeed this is part of the whole like exploratory science endeavor. <sighs> oh my goodness. Oh, first under the ice. Well, okay, so we had already been waiting topside um, and it was very cold and you can see that the weather is, is quite harsh, but getting into the water, it was almost like a relief. So first thing was, it was a relief because that was what needed to happen to do any of the scientific work was to actually get into the water. Um, but getting in under the ice, you have to go through a layer of broken ice that's constantly freezing and you're breaking it and it's refreezing. Um, but it's incredible. It was beautiful. It was so, so beautiful. That first two meters um, into the water through the ice of broken like ice that had refrozen and broken up again. It's like being in a chandelier. I know it sounds weird, but it's like being inside of like a crystal chandelier palace kind of thing because there's a lot of light coming in and then it all gets refracted um, off of those ice crystals. So you really, it's a little disorienting, but you really feel like sparkly. It's very mad. It's, it, I didn't expect it to be that magical. I only expected it to be like cold with low visibility. Um, but I didn't expect it to be sparkly and it was very, it was really sparkly. It was incredible. Incredible. One of the, like, definitely in the top five, um, maybe the top three most incredible things I've ever experienced. What I'm hoping that it does is that it helps us focus on these incredible organisms that are photosynthesizers. Most people are not thinking about photosynthesis, and if they are, they're thinking about trees and forests in terrestrial or land-based environments. But our planet is more than 70% ocean, and in that surface ocean, we've got things like phytoplankton living there, and in the Arctic Ocean, we have the addition of um, to, in addition to phytoplankton, we also have sea ice algae, which are related, obviously, to phytoplankton. They come from the same large community or bank of organisms. But what makes them special is that they have evolved and adapted to live specifically in the sea ice habitat. And they have a particular contribution uh, to our climate, certainly to polar regions. 
And yes, it's true. In the polls, both in the North and the South, um, the, they experience those ecosystems and the organisms that live in them experience six months of sunlight and six months of darkness. And in complete darkness, organisms cannot photosynthesize. But what we've, ha what we've learned as a community and have found is that the level of light that is necessary for certain organisms that have evolved to live in low light environments like the high Arctic is much lower than anticipated. So they are extremely sensitive to light um, and their ability to utilize light at very low levels and be productive, meaning building their cells, building um, their capacity, creating energy and using that energy to capture carbon dioxide and in return produce oxygen is important in how we calculate their overall contribution to um, the biological component of climate. And so <clears throat> what this research hopes to do is sort of shed a light on the importance of the organisms that live within sea ice and a certain type of feature of sea ice, like sea ice ridges, that these are ecological hotspots and the organisms that live there are specific, that they can do things in a, a way in which their counterparts living in the open ocean may not be as efficient at doing, and that the amount of light that is necessary for them to do that work um, is actually lower. It's a lower threshold than we had originally thought or historically had thought. And so the more measurements we make and the more experiments and trials we have with those organisms trying to see how sensitive and how low the light can be gives us a way to, to look at that environment kind of through a new lens and say, actually, the productive season of these organisms extends beyond these couple of months when the light is very, very strong. It also includes these tail end times of the, the spring season and then the fall season where these organisms are so efficient at utilizing light that they can continue, to, they are productive. They can start to being productive earlier and then continue to be productive longer. And that changes our overall estimate of their contribution to the ecosystem. So how much carbon they're moving through the ecosystem, how much oxygen they may be producing um, over that time period. And those have really strong implications for how we input information into models of the region of the Arctic and what we anticipate these ecosystems will be like in response to the loss of ice, in response to increasing temperatures. Um, and then that has a, a number of cascading effects across the food web. So <clears throat> that's why that work is important. And, and <clears throat> I want to iterate that the work I do is a very, very tiny sliver of a large body of work that has been done for, for decades, if not centuries by others. Um, and that is currently done by a number of important experts across our planet. Um, and so together we're trying to contribute pieces of information and knowledge to push our collective understanding forward. And while this is, has been and is an important uh, piece of that and contribution, it's not a singular um, contribution. It's not exclusive. Um, and I think that's important to say that, you know, science moves forward because it's a, an orchestrated effort by many people and many entities um, to invest that time and expertise to do that work, which is meticulous and often frustrating. Um, and yeah, but, but this is certainly an opportunity uh, for me personally and professionally that has been remarkable. So it's it, it's a big deal in that in that way, for sure. Ah, oh, gosh, I love microbes. Yeah, so microbes are my jam. Um, they are the unsung heroes of our planet because people take them for granted. People aren't even thinking about them. Like my world and career um, as a microbial ecologist, an oceanographer, a sea ice ecologist is focused on microbes. And the thing is, is that people don't realize it, but microbes are everywhere. They are the reason that you and I can be alive. We actually have more microbial cells within our bodies than we do human cells on any given day. Every surface of our planet, even the things we build, are covered in microbes. And I know for a lot of folks, that's gonna sound gross and like really strange, but the thing is, um, 
If you don't focus on disease causing microbes and you look at the 99.9 .9 other percent of microbes in our world, you'll realize that they're the reason that everything else can exist. And they're the unsung heroes because, you know, they control everything, like I was saying earlier, from like air quality and like the smell of the air and like the formation of clouds, all the way to how we are able to grow our food, right? Like fertile soil is not just fertile because of its organic composition, it's fertile because of its microbiome, right? And that microbiome is made of microbes. And so you sort of look at the ocean and you see this vastness and people are intrigued by those large organisms, whales and fish and sea turtles, and they're incredible, don't get me wrong. Coral reefs, amazing. All of these things are amazing. But the underpinning of those you know, majestic organisms, these incredible systems like coral reefs and, and other types of um, really charismatic things that we associate with the ocean, those are actually, you know, bathing in a sea of microbes. And those microbes do everything from protecting um, those organisms from disease, controlling an ecosystem's balance um, in their acidity, like the pH, for instance, sometimes and also controlling the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen that our planet is producing or consuming in that way and trapping CO2. So microbes are, you know, they're incredible and they surprise us every single and every single investigation that we make. Um, we know so little about their biodiversity. So we're literally just scratching the surface. Um, the technology that we've developed in the last 25 years to be able to study microbes on our planet uh, is absolutely incredible and is giving us a way to look at it, look at like microbial genetics and evolution in ways we'd never would have been able to do before. So it's also an exciting time to be a microbial ecologist. Um, and microbes are, you know, how we make medicine, right? <laughs> like people forget that like penicillin is actually a type of, a type of microbe that we then turned into uh, an antibiotic to help fight diseases that were affecting us. So I think, you know, yeah, I could go on and on forever about microbes, but they're the things that connect us to the world. They're the things that connect us to each other. And when we're thinking beyond ourselves and beyond this planet, you know, when we're looking for life elsewhere, what we're really looking for are signatures of microbes. Yes, I know there's a lot of people who are thinking about little green aliens. Yeah, more likely than not, those little green aliens are single cell microbes. Um, so they're, 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 they're everywhere. Um, we're looking for life in other places by looking for microbes. Um, they're the fundamental building block of ecosystems um, when they very when they very first start. Um, and so, yeah, they they do incredible things, and they make this planet habitable, but they also keep it habitable, um, and they they keep us healthy. Microbes are the best. No, <laughs> no, but no, but yeah, it would be great if people were like, wow, microbes are awesome. I love microbes. No, but I think um, all kidding aside, in addition to being microbes are being the best, I think if they can see that science is this powerful thing that we do, that we can do collectively, that they can be a part of, um, that it has the power to change our perspective of the world and the environment and our place in it, that would be astounding. If they feel and think more conscientiously of how we are connected in our world to environments as far flung as the North Pole, that would be amazing because we are. What happens in the Arctic Ocean, especially the high Arctic, does affect us where we live. It affects where we can grow food. It affects where it rains. It affects where we see storms. Um, it affects so many things that we experience in our everyday life. And so for people to just become a little bit more aware of that connectivity, I think would be huge coming out of this episode. Um, but mostly I hope people are just in awe and wonder of the incredible planet that we live on and that they somehow translate that feeling of wonder and awe into positive actions in their everyday life to protect our planet and to protect the ecosystems that we live in.